Good afternoon. Well, we've just got a recap of what we've done earlier, but let's go through it now. Um, so this is me and John. Uh, we are kind of doing a DevOps talk from the point of a dev and the point of operations. Um, John works at IBM, if you didn't see before, and I'm at Puppet. Um, so we're going to go through what are we going to cover. We're going to look at building for failure, because we don't want our application to go down. If our application's down, we're not stealing money, so we're not making money. Uh, but if you're a business, it's kind of the same. So we've got a lot of parodies here, um, but in a real life application, you kind of don't want your application to go down either. Um, we want to make sure it's secure. We don't want to uh, let anyone from the security team in Initech come in and hack us and take our money. So we're going to look at protecting ourselves from that. Um, we want to make sure that it, it's logging properly and we can see the transactions going into our bank account, no, no one else's. So we're going we're gonna to go through that. And then we'll do a deploy of the new Initech website and sneak in our money stealing application behind it. I am, as I said, I work for Puppet. I'm a Docker captain. I'm based out of Sydney, Australia. So it's been a long trip to get here, but it was definitely worthwhile. Um, so here's, here's what we're going to cover and the, the sort of um, infrastructure we're going to cover. So we're going to use um, both Docker, UCP, and Swarm mode. Um, Docker UCP is actually built off the back of Swarm mode. It's the enterprise product from Docker. And of course, any tech is enterprise. We'll use enterprise software. We'll make sure that the infrastructure is highly available by actually building four nodes in our cluster. Um, we'll host our images in an internal Docker registry. Um, we'll make sure that the app is logging and the image is signed. So we'll go through Notary and we'll also go through some um, vulnerability scanning because the last thing we want to do is see that our app's vulnerable and the Initech security team hacks us and takes our money because that would be really bad. Um, so we're going to build for failure. So first of all, if you didn't see, we'll do a bit of recap. Do you want to explain a little bit about the application you built? And tell people about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we did get a pretty good intro from our MC today. But um, so yeah, if you weren't here, basically, Initech is this evil, corporate, evil corporation that we want to take advantage of. And they are processing interest on transactions thousands of times per day. So typically, the, their, their software rounds to two decimal places. And what our software does is, you know, instead of rounding off the interest, it just deposits it into our own bank account. So you know, I think, Scott, we're going to make sure that our application is up all the time to uh, optimize our, our revenue. Because yeah. it's a really good app. It works while we're even asleep. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in this day and age, you like outages, you don't want outages at all. And I think AWS has the motto, build for failure. Um, we're going to take that, that motto as well. Um, because as we said, it, this, any minute that this application is not running, we're not getting interest into our bank account. Um, so Docker have two applications that look after high availability within the infrastructure space. So the open, open source offering is Swarm mode that's built into the engine. And the enterprise offering is Universal Control Plane. And that sits on top of Swarm mode and has some extra functionality that we'll have a look at. Um, so if you haven't used Swarm mode before, Swarm mode become native in the 112 engine. It was released about a year ago at DockerCon 16, I believe it was. Um, it allows you to schedule containers across compute nodes. So it takes a lot of compute resources and makes them into one cluster. So the cluster acts as a single compute resource or, and with memory as well. It comes with overlay networking for communications between um, containers. It has service discovery via DNS. So you can um, hit each of the containers on the DNS name of the container name. It has load balancing, so there's uh, there's is H HTTP uh, meshing, mesh routing, sorry. And we'll, we'll, we'll have a look at um, one of the constraints of that is if you have multiple services running on the same port, um, say port 80 or 443, um, Swarm doesn't look after load balancing of HTTP headers, but we'll have a look at how to do that later on. We'll, we'll, we'll sort that out. Um, it's secure by default. So all comes from the cluster uh, have SSL on by default. And the backend for the cluster is actually built on the Raft consensus protocol. Um, so that's where all the cluster operations are and how it picks all its leaders and, and things like that. Um, so I just have a look at a quick reference architecture of, of what Swarm actually looks like underneath. 
So as you can see there, we've got multiple manager nodes where they are involved in the raft consensus. And the worker nodes are not. They're just going to run application workloads. Um, one of the best practices that you should do is not have too many managers in the consensus. Um, the smaller the amount of managers, the faster the consensus is. Um, so if you're looking at a smaller cluster, you should have three. Um, a bigger cluster, you should have five. Um, you can go to seven, but there's not that many use cases for seven um, manager nodes. Um, but you can have tons and tons of worker nodes. Um, I think that there's been a project where they've done over 2,000 nodes, I believe, in, in a swarm cluster. Um, so yeah, keep your, keep your manager nodes small. Um, I don't think you'll, well, hopefully you'll never have the, dis, um, the unfortunate um, event happen where you'll lose four out of five of your manager nodes if they're set up across like multiple AZs or geolocations, things like that. Um, so universal control plane takes what you get in swarm mode and then it adds uh, a few other, other things to it. There's a graphical, graphical interface for um, management. There's TLS authentication to protect your Docker API by default. There's real-time metrics of on the cluster via dashboards. And there's LDAP and RBAC. So that's important if you have multiple teams um, running and using the cluster. So the open, source, the open source cluster doesn't have the functionality where you can have um, LDAP controlling anything more than a user, and the user has the rights to the swarm. Um, this is an easy um, setup for you. There's an LDAP backend that you push it into. You create teams within the cluster, and then you give them access to the rights that they need. So if you have a look, this is what the UCP cluster looks like. There's a, a Docker engine, a UCP agent, and then a manager. So it's fairly similar to how Swarm works. And as you can see, there's a UCP worker. So the architecture is fairly similar, but uh, it's just another layer that sits on top of Swarm mode. Um, we'll have a look now at how load balancing works in both Swarm mode and um, UCP. So if you can see that you've got an ing ingress network that's set up by default by Swarm, uh, an external load balancer, and then you've got multiple um, tasks sitting there on port 8000. You can see there in, on host 3 that even though there's not, nothing running on um, port 8000, the traffic gets routed to the server that has the container on it. Um, that's the Swarm HTTP mesh routing doing that. And it, if you hit any of the nodes, it, Swarm will put you to the node where the actual service lives. Um, so that's how the service discovery inside Swarm works as well. This is how, we'll have a look at the DNS service discovery now. So as you can see there, there's multiple uh, DNS names. And you can see that the resolver sits on 127.0.0.11. Um, that's the DNS server for the engine. And Swarm will um, send all the DNS A records around as part of the consensus. The Docker engine then, when you, um, when you update or move a container and you need to connect to the service via any, any protocol, um, you just have to call it by the container name. So whatever the container name you give the, the service, that will be its DNS name within the Swarm cluster. Um, so what are we actually going to build today? Um, so what we're going to build is we're going to build a Jenkins server, a Docker trusted registry, um, three UCP nodes, and an open source Docker Swarm mode. We actually changed this at the last minute. We're actually <laughs> Uh, because we had constraints on the amount of nodes and ports we had available, we actually got four UCP mode, uh, nodes now. Um, but you could use the open source if you wanted to do some of this. Um, we've built all of this with Puppet. Um, there will be a GitHub page at the end of this, and it's a single command, and it will build all of this for you. So let's go through some of the, the, the security now. Um, there's three things that we want to do. We want to make sure that the, there's no vulnerabilities in our underlying images. We want to make sure that once the, it's gone through the CD process and the image is just the way me and John want, want it, we want to sign it to make sure that only our engines will accept it. And then we want to make sure that we have, don't have any unwanted processes or read writes in our container that we don't know about. So we'll use AppArmor to protect the underlying file, serve, um, file system and also any of the kernel modules that can be loaded. Um, security scanning with DTR happens at, at rest. So when you push an image into your DTR, as soon as the build process, uh, uh, as the push is finished, it will then kick off a security scan. 
Scanning is automated, as I said, and there's pre-built dashboards that can show you the vulnerabilities that are in the container. And it kind of looks like this. So what happens if you do a Docker push? It pushes the file system up, and then it runs a, uh, a scan against the CVE databases for, app, um, for sorry, Debian or um, Red Hat, and it lets you know if there's any vulnerable packages. If you want to bore down a little bit more, you can click on that actual um, tab, and it'll tell you the exact packages that are vulnerable. And, um, and there's click-throughs to remediations if you want to see how, if there's a newer version or not through the distributor of the package. Now we're going to go to image signing with Notary. How many people know um, what Notary is or used it or? Not many. OK. We'll go through this bit a little bit slowly because it's, it, it is a little bit complex. Basically, what Notary, Notary does is Notary gives an, Im an image a crypto ID. And that crypto ID is trusted by your Docker engine at the, at the time um, of it running. So if you set up, um, for example, Notary to only allow your engine to run any containers that have been signed and nothing else, if someone got onto your server and ran Docker run Nginx, it would actually throw an error and say, this is not a trusted container. It needs to be signed with the crypto hash that your Notary server has. Um, so therefore, you can, you can protect yourself from anything getting in from outside that you don't want to. And you know at that point in time that the, that container is not changed. If there is a change to the container and the notary, and notary knows that there's been a change, um, it will then throw an error and not, not spawn it as well. So this is a notary architecture. There's two parts to it. There's the clients, which are the Docker engines themselves. There's a notary server. And there's the crypto signer. And I'll go through the architecture of how this works. Um, so basically what the client does is it looks up the server at the time and checks the crypto or the crypto of the actual container. Um, if that's correct, the engine will then allow it to, to run. If it's not for example, and someone's either changed a crypto or it has no crypto, the engine will throw an error and say that it's untrusted and I can only use trusted um, images. Um, so you can go through there. There's a private key exchange um, where the metadata is stored and the tokens. Um, but if you want to know more about this, maybe it would be a conversation that you can grab me around the conference and I can talk more about Notary because it is quite a beast. and I'm. Just going to going to talk about it a little bit now, um, but I'm more than happy to talk to people um, after the after this talk about it. If you're interested in image lining, um, now what we want to do is protect the processes in our container. Um, so what we don't want is someone to come into uh, a vulnerability, say within Nginx or within OpenSSL or something, and then go, hey, we found an app where they're stealing money. We'll just change the bank account details and we'll steal their money. Because um, that would be horrible and all our work would be gone. Um, so what we want to do is make sure that the, only the file system where the application is writing to is available. Everything else um, is not being loaded. There's no kernel modules that the container doesn't need being loaded. And there's no um, executables being run that aren't allowed, to, that we don't know about as part of the application. So I tried to get an app armor pro uh, policy onto a, a slide, and it just looked nonsense because it is quite long. Um, I suggest if you want to learn more about app armor, again, um, grab me and I'll go through it. it. It is a little bit difficult to pick up at first, but once you've got it, it is a really simp a simple um, thing to run. If you just want to run a default App Armor process, um, profile, Docker actually ships with one, but it's not uh, it's not enabled by default. Um, so you can actually run Docker Run, and as you can see there, the App Armor option to Docker default is on. Um, that will probably um, suffice to about eighty percent of use cases for most applications. Um, it just is the same default of um, like process calls and file system lockdowns that um, most applications won't need. Um, so it's a really good way to start off using App Armor. Um, it's just to turn this on. As you can see, it's just one flag security opt, App Armor equals Docker, uh, uh, Docker default. Uh, and if you want to create your own, um, you can, and you can put it in the App Armor folder in, uh, in the Etsy Docker folder. So one of the questions when I go on client sites is, um, 
can we use our existing infrastructure? Like a lot of people have spent a lot of time using Elk, they've, or they've got some some Fluid D implementations, or or anything like that. How do we how do we um, leverage that to in a containerized world? Um, and applying logging to a containerized world is actually really easy. So you've got two options. You can just set the logging option when you spawn a container. Um, but a project that I really like is um, Logspout by Glider Labs. What this allows you to do is um, it collects all the logs from all the containers running on that box, and then it ships it to whatever logging infrastructure you have, whether it could be Splunk, it could be um, AWS, it could be any of them. There's plugins for just about all the major ones. The reason I like this is it correlates it in one place. Uh, if you're going to set up TLS on your logs, which is probably a really good idea, I know me and John have done that because we don't want our transactions being seen by anyone at any corp, so uh, any tech, sorry. So we, won't, we don't want to uh, ship logs unencrypted. Um, this allows you to set up the TLS once on every single host, and then all the logs are shipped encrypted from all the containers. And as the containers move around, it doesn't matter, um, Logspout will capture that and be able to ship it for you. And it also cuts down on network traffic because you don't have multiple containers trying to hit your log stash or your Redis instance at once. Um, I have had instances where Redis is like not being able to handle it when there's a lot of container traffic all trying to point at it um, from different different hosts. This sort of like uh, correlates it and then sends it, uh, and that fixes an issue I have seen in the past. So I'll just here's just a base architecture of of what it looks like. Here's container A or container B could be absolutely anything that's running. You've got Logspout that listens to the socket that Docker runs on to get the uh, to get the logs, and you've got the Docker that engine after after it. And then Logspout will then ship the logs to wherever um, whatever you like. I like Logstash, so I put Logstash there. You could have a Redis instance in front of this. Uh, it could be to Splunk, as I said. It could be to AWS or Azure Logs as well. Um, there's plugins for absolutely pretty much every login interface through the, in Logspout. Now we'll get to deploying our app, which is cool because so we can make some money. Um, so we've gone through a lot at the moment. So we've gone through some some image shining things. We've gone through um, some security best practices. Um, but how do we put that all together? So how do how, how do all those pieces of the puzzle fit together in a CD process so we can deliver the application? Um, so that's what we're going to go through now and just run through. So this is how the Im images get to the DTR. So a user would do a git push to whatever git server that you have um, with the Docker file. That would then kick off a Jenkins job, and you would run your build job, any testing job, any integration job that you want, uh, and then push it to the registry. You can then have the registry do a vulnerability scan of it. And once the vulnerability scan comes up OK, you can have a web webhook to say to Notary, hey, that's cool. This image is fine, and it will sign it. Um, the reason you do want to do that is because in a production environment, you, you don't want any anything leaking, and you want to make sure that, um, for example, uh, in in a, a previous job, I was a platform engineering solution architect, and the, what we did for the developers is we had a catalog of Docker images, and we knew that they were saying they'd been no packages were vulnerable in them, and the developers could go from there. Uh, and we signed all those with Notary to make sure that the, they were exactly the way we wanted them to be. Um, developers could then, if they wanted to, add something or remove something, make a pull request against the Docker file, and then it would go through the process uh, if the pull request was approved or, and it was something saying. But this way, we had some control over the base images that the developers were using to build the applications on. Um, this process would then happen again once the application was there. We would do the same thing. We would go through, we would scan it, we would make sure that there's integration tests and the application was working exactly the way we would want, and then we'd sign it. So all through the pr process, we could actually use um, any of the crypto signing and any of this process for compliance or any regulatory needs, um, which I think will be becoming a lot more prevalent within Docker in the next few years as more people are moving to production is how do you handle compliance and regulatory needs with, with containers. Um, it can be done. I, as I said, I did put together a solution um, where it was done and, and uh, signed off. So yeah, I think all these, uh, all these bits and pieces uh, are really needed to be looked at. Uh, but it's a kind of 
puts you in a weird spot because the SRI team is now kind of like being the security team. Um, so we weren't like 100% in charge of the security. We actually offhanded the crypto. So we got the crypto from the security team. So we didn't actually hold the crypto. Uh, and what that gave was separation of duty. So we could say, hey, we're going through all this process to make sure it's secure, but we don't actually own the crypto. Because if we own the crypto, we could actually make changes to um, the images because we had the keys, but we didn't have the keys. So for your compliantry um, pieces, that made the security team really, really happy. And doing all this through, Jenkins gave us a real-time log of everything that's happening that we could um, go back through to an auditor um, because we could see a remediation um, per build tag. So every time we build an image, we wouldn't use latest ever. We would use a tag of what version it was up to. And if it failed because there was vulnerabilities or application defects, we could then use the logs in the Jenkins job to go back to the auditor and say, this is what we did. We remediated it in the next version. So your CD process actually becomes became live documentation for um, auditing purpose, and that was that was really handy as well. So once we get um, the image and it's all happy, it's signed, notary is there, and everything's good. What we actually do is we the user can this could be automated off the back of um, the last job, or we could have a user actually kick it off manually in Jenkins. And But basically what happens is Jenkins is going to get a request to deploy a, a stack. It's going to send a JSON payload to um, the remote Docker API, and it's going to pull the image from the trusted registry and go through the process of checking the crypto, and then the application will be running. Um, one of the things you'll see here is we're actually using Puppet to deploy the underlying infrastructure, but only up to the API and making sure the API is in a defined state that um, the Jenkins server and the application team can then ingest. Um, so you have two layers of container orchestration here. You've got one that the application teams are using with the JSON payload that they can write themselves um, to deploy. And then you've got Puppet deploying containers on the infrastructure layer and building the API, which the developers ingest. Um, so it's kind of a different way of looking at how you can deploy containers, but I found that this, this solution works really, really well. Um, here's the demo, if you want to get it. Um, it's actually private at the moment. I will, <laughs> I will make it public um, straight after the talk. Um, so, before in John's talk, we built built the cluster. So let's have a look at what we've got. There's our cluster running. Um, we can just have a look at the services that 100% of them are running. So you can see there we've got an application called DockerCon. We didn't really want to put an application called, hey, we're stealing your money. So we named it DockerCon. Um, but if you have a look there inside DockerCon, we can see all the services that are running. Um, so the database server, the, um, in the compute API, and everything that John built all looks good. You can see that we've also built Jenkins, and it's running, and it's been all happy. Um, we've got etcd doing some configuration um, lookups, and we've also got interlock running. What Interlock does is it, it handles the HTTP header traffic. So it actually allows us to run multiple um, applications on port 80 um, for this example. Um, and it's a dynamic, so Interlock is, does dynamically listens to swarm events and then updates Nginx pending on where the application is. Um, so we're actually going to use it. We're going to deploy the new Initech website, and we'll actually see whatever node it goes to uh, won't matter because we'll hit it with a DNS name. And Interlock will listen to where it's gone on the swarm. It will then update Nginx, and Nginx will route the layer 7 traffic, um, the HTTP traffic, to the new website. So let's deploy the website. Deploy container. So basically what this is, is doing now is it makes an auth request to the Docker Remote API. After the auth request is, is 
um, accept it from the Docker API, it actually passes the CA bundle of the TLS that it needs to connect to the API. Um, after that, we'll create the container from a JSON payload, and then we should get the container hash back of where it is. All right, I'll come back to that. It might take a little bit. The internet might be a little bit slow. Um, at the same time, though, it is uh, deploying John's app, and we will go to big money. And you can see, since this morning in John's talk, we've got $48.38. And and we figure it's about $32 an hour, so it's not bad, considering we're not really doing anything. <laughs> And as you can see there, we've deployed the Initech website. Uh, so if we just go to where am And our new website's there. So not only have we done a production deployment of the new Initech website, we've also deployed um, John's application. And it's all running on our universal control plane. And if, you're, if you have an operations team that are not like hands-on with Docker, um, this services panel here is really, really good because you can see here exactly what's happening. You can click on like our DockerCon app. You can see all our containers are green, um, the host they're running on, and where how everything is. Uh, so if I just refresh this page, actually. Oh, go to containers. You can see web app went to UCP02. Um, but because of Interlock, there's four hosts. Uh, it could have gone to any of those four hosts. And Interlock listened to the Swarm event. It updated Nginx. And I just had to type in the, the URL. And it had done the HTTP redirect for me. And that was all done dynamically. Um, so if, you, if you're looking at, uh, you could do that with also an AWS ELB, or uh, ALB, sorry. Um, but for running this on my laptop, Nginx and Interlock worked really, really well. Well, John, that's, we can probably buy some beers tonight. Yeah. <laughs> but if we let this run till about five. I figure we got enough to drink. For sure. Sure, yeah. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, the code for this will be on GitHub. It basically built all this. All you need um, pre installed is Vagrant. Uh, it'll download the rest of the stuff from the net. Um, and it'll build four servers and all this infrastructure for you. Uh, with John's app, uh, Jenkins, uh, it'll see the Jenkins job, and you'll just have to click a button to deploy the Initech website. Um, so if, as I said, I'll make that public as soon as I get off the, the stage. And that's it. Just questions, I think. Thanks, guys. That was really awesome again. Uh, fantastic conclusion for this morning's session. Uh, so feel free to come up and ask questions. Please come up to where the mics are. I'll kick off again, because I've always got questions. So um, the first thing I was going to ask is about AppArmor. I'm not going to get into the heavy details, but some of the, some of the capabilities you were describing, you could also potentially get from running a read-only container. Yes. Yeah, yeah so, you so you could get the file system protection that way. Yeah, yeah. you could. If you, if you run a read-only container, you, you could do that. But um, the benefit of running App Armor is it allows you to have write, like, um, write in some locations where you need it. Um, so like, for example, we want to make sure all our transactions are running correctly and log into a certain directory where any tech won't find it. We could um, write a, a custom App Armor profile to allow, allow logs to write in that file directory only. Um, and then we will be able to ship that through um, Logspout and then encrypt it on the way through, and it'll be in our Elk environment where we will be able to see that the money's just rolling in. So that's the, that's the difference of uh, a read-only container compared to using App Armor. Okay, cool. And uh, oh, just one more. So um, uh, the other thing was about Jenkins and the, the multi-stage builds. So am I right in thinking that because you've got your multi-stage build where the build agent has got Maven and, or whatever stack you're using, your, your Jenkins worker nodes don't need anything installed other than Docker? Yep, that's it. Boom. It's just a Docker remote API. So it just uses a payload. Um, it's a pretty, I'll show you the example. It's a pretty um, 
kind of easy example, this one. Uh, It's actually just using curl as well. Um, so as you can see there, that's just the payload. Um, so it has like the interlock URL, so the interlock knows how to handle the HTTP traffic. It's actually originally running on port um, 3000, but it got redirected because head I redirected the headers to port 80. Um, and that's all you need to create a basic container with a remote API. Um, you can go into any of the stacks, any of the Docker calls, any of Actually, actually, anything that you can do with Docker in the CLI, you can do with a remote, remote API. Um, the documentation's really good. I think the latest remote API is 1.25. Um, but yeah, you can configure Swarm, you can configure stacks, you can do everything through the remote API. This is just a, a really simple um, sort of example to get people to think about using the remote API. Hello. Um, do you have any examples or recommendations of how do we separate code versus config. So we have a lot of old code which has been written over the past 20 years, uh, which we're trying to put on containers so we can ship them at different cloud providers. And one of the problems that we have is a lot of code is, you know, a lot of configuration properties are inside you know, the code. Yep. How do we, is there an easy way of doing it? Um, Any recommendations? It, it, recommendations? I have easy, probably not. Um, the, um, uh, if you've got technical debt like that, the best thing to do would be to move the secrets or that, if, if there's secrets and stuff, to vault um, and then move any of that sort of dynamic configuration to something like console or etcd. Um, that's how I would design it now. And, or if I moved a legacy application, that's where I would start to, to look at. Um, it will take a little bit of work and a bit of testing, but once you get there, you'll find it's really, really simple. Okay. Thank you. No worries.